Our guests today are Dr. Robert Klitzman and Professor Glenn Cohn. And I will be brief in introducing you to Dr. Klitzman, who's on my far right. And he is Professor of Psychiatry and Master of the Bioethics Program at Columbia University. Professor Cohn is on my near right, and he is Professor of Law at Harvard and Director of the Patrick Flom Center for Health, Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics, also at Harvard. His most recent book, Patients with Passports, Medical Tourism, Law, and Ethics, is the subject of the discussion this afternoon. So to start us off, uh, what do you think are the biggest problems with medical tourism today? So when you're talking about, I often divide the industry at least into two, people who are traveling for things that are legal, hip replacements, cardiac bypass, cosmetic surgery, and people who are traveling for things that are illegal where they're coming from, assisted suicide, abortion, some forms of stem cell therapy. On the legal side, I think the biggest problem is your ability to know about the quality of health care you're going to get abroad is very, very poor. It's very hard to know. Some of these are centers of excellence on par with Mayo. Some of them are uh, much less good quality. If something does go wrong, what are your legal rights? What are your ability to recover? If you need follow-up care, as most of us do, are those records being transmitted in a way that your doctor can use and know about? And lastly, I would say on the legal side, what's the effect of your healthcare decisions on the destination country? If you go to a place like Thailand and India, what's the systematic effect of having wealthy Americans going there in terms of redirecting resources from public sector hospitals, resources away from public health towards trying to build this burgeoning industry? So let's take some of the illegal things. So let's take abortion, for instance. So. Uh, if I'm in a country where abortion is illegal and I want an abortion, what should I do or what are the issues that come up? As we know, I mean, especially in Latin America, but still in parts of Europe, uh, abortion is often illegal. Where there are exceptions, there tend to be narrow. Not even every country recognizes a life of the mother exception or a rape uh, exception. So we have uh, many women who are in a difficult situation. Uh, some countries like Ireland have actually by law passed what's known as the Travel Amendment in Ireland to say you can't do it in Ireland, but if you go abroad uh, to England or the Netherlands or wherever, that's perfectly fine. So they've kind of arrived at this sort of modus vivendi, this, w this way of kind of uh, splitting the difference, if you will. Uh, for many poor women, that's not uh, an option. And interestingly, in the period before Roe v. Wade in the United States, we actually had a lot of intranational medical tourism for abortion, as well as travel to Mexico and the like. Uh, but these women are in very difficult situations and desperate uh, situations in some ways. And what I do in the book, I ask whether Ireland has it right to say if you believe abortion should be criminalized, in particular based on concern for the fetus's welfare and believing in fetal personhood, what should your position as Ireland be in terms of people traveling abroad? And it's not so clear to me that if you take that perspective, and for many of us, I'm sure, it's hard to take that perspective because we don't believe abortion be, should be criminalized within the country. But if you do believe that's the case, why shouldn't you try to criminalize it abroad? And so there's some international law about when you can extend your criminal law. The US, for example, we have what's known as the PROTECT Act. So it's a crime in the US for a US citizen to go abroad and engage in sex tourism. In the UK, it's a crime for a British citizen to go abroad and get a female genital cutting done on their daughter, right? So the way I want to pose the question is, those seem to make sense to us. For a country that views this as a moral wrong, should they take the same approach or not? Let's take uh, medical tourism to get organs. So of course, in this country, there are long waiting lists for people to get organs. So if I need a kidney, why not go to the Philippines to get a kidney where people will sell me their kidney? What's, what's wrong with that? What would you say? Yeah, so uh, let me take it at this in a couple different directions. Right? The first is, so every time I give one of these talks, somebody comes up to me almost every time afterwards and say that they have a loved one or a friend who's on a waiting list. 
and you know some of them want the how-to guide to know what to do. So one actually interesting part of the story of the of the book is I go through what data we have on people who've returned from kidney purchase abroad. And the studies are conflicting in some ways. Some have higher rates of immunorejection. Others, in other of the studies, it actually looks like the, the graph rejection rate is the same. Uh, sometimes there's gaps in the data. So there is this question about whether this is going to go well for you or not. But thinking about yourself as a person whose actions have consequences for others, you have to have a view about whether you think uh, the buying and selling of organs is morally problematic or not. Most people who think it's problematic rely on a series of different arguments. One is corruption. This is a difference in the way we think the body should be valued. It devalues the body or devalues people's personhood to do this. Another is coercion. It's actually coercive. Exploitation. We think people are exploited even if not uh, coerced. And then lastly, I would say there's arguments from justified paternalism, which says even if someone's not exploited or coerced, uh, even if we think there's no corruption of the human body or one we're willing to accept, we think that the people who are engaged in the selling of kidneys are engaged in a practice that actually doesn't benefit them and turns out in the long run to hurt them. Uh, my own view is the strongest, most compelling argument is actually the last of those arguments. Uh, and in the book, I kind of review the data and the stories of kidney vendors from Bangladesh, Pakistan, uh, the Philippines, and India. And the story is actually eerily similar in all of these polities, I would say. People are paid somewhere between $2,000 and $5,000 to sell one of their kidneys. They usually end up getting about two-thirds of the money at the end of the day. Most are motivated to sell a kidney to get themselves out of bonded labor or to uh, afford a dowry or to pay off uh, a debt or to get a market stall. Uh, most of them, so I would say 60 to 70 percent when you follow up with them, and the follow-up data is relatively soon thereafter. It's self-reported health data and self-reported levels of regret. About 60 to 70 percent of them usually say they were sorry that they did it or they wouldn't recommend someone else to do it. There are also some more unsavory elements of this trade. Uh, so for example, uh, in the US, if you donate a kidney, the nephrectomy scar tends to be about three inches. These men from Bangladesh end up with nephrectomy scars that are about 20 inches. They come back into the society, and one thing they don't anticipate, which was so interesting to me, is that actually the social stigma of being uh, a kidney man is in some ways uh, the worst part. They have difficulty with marriage. And many of them just don't achieve the goals they set out to do. They never get to pay for the dowry. They never get the stall in the market. To me, if we were in the US and talking about a legal market in the US, I would say, oh, OK, well, let's improve the informed consent. Let's improve the information transmission. Let's do all these things and regulate the market. But I have no confidence in our ability to kind of regulate a market that is already illegal. Because realize that selling a kidney is illegal in every country in the world except Iran. And in Iran, it's legal only to sell it to the government, not to sell it to anybody else. The government then, in theory at least, again, hard to know what's true or not true about Iran, has a system of organ allocation like ours. But they merely they have a mixed system where it's OK to sell but not to buy. So let's talk about assisted reproductive technology. So in the United States, we uh, are one of the few countries in the world where you can buy and sell human eggs. Uh, you can now buy and sell embryos. Women will rent their wombs. A lot of Western European countries uh, don't allow exchange of funds except for just basic expenses. So if I'm in France and I want to, uh, if I'm a single woman or if I'm a married woman, I can't have a child, or am a gay man, I can go to Belgium and, and buy someone's egg or get services I can't in France. What, what should happen with that? Is that OK? Is that a problem? Yes, yeah, so, so there's a huge amount of reproductive tourism within Europe, which is interesting. So there's a study I talk about done by Eshray that looks at the flow back and forth. And then there is a second level of travel outside of Europe into other countries. So the people in Europe are often traveling to get something illegal. People from America who go to a place like India are often shopping on price, right? So you're asking more about the illegal side. Well, to me, the answer depends on asking France, why does France have this prohibition in place to begin with? If your concern is something about the health of these children or something like that, that seems to me to apply equally whether people are staying at home or going abroad. If your concern, though, is about the exploitation of surrogates, here I think it's a more complicated uh, question for a number of reasons. The first is you have a home country or destination country where people are traveling that's made a decision to make this legal, right? And are you the person, the country, that's supposed to protect the interests 
uh, of Indian surrogates as the French government when you think about your policy. On the other hand, by making it illegal in France, you've essentially known people are going to go abroad to do this. So in some ways, you've created the market conditions where this trade occurs. So maybe you have some responsibility here. And apart from these questions about what you should do, because you could, it turns out Turkey makes it a crime not only in Turkey, but to go abroad as a Turkish citizen to engage in some forms of artificial insemination by donor. You could, in theory, have the same rule uh, in France and say, not only are we banning commercial surrogacy in France, but if you are a French citizen and you go to India, we're going to say you've committed a crime in France by doing that. Apart from that question, and here again, my view is that this case is different in some ways from, let's say, abortion or assisted suicide, because the kinds of harms we're talking about, harms of exploitation, for example, I think it's not as clear that France has as much to say or as much moral authority or as much of a right to legislate in order to protect Indian surrogates. But apart from this question, you also face a second difficulty, which France itself has actually faced in a case involving people traveling to California, but many countries face, which is what do you do when a child is born through the surrogacy system? and they want to bring the child back to France. Do you recognize their parentage in France? Do you recognize the citizenship of these children in France? And on the one hand, it seems very draconian to say that the child should suffer for the sins of the father uh, and the like. Uh, on the other hand, if this were to happen in France, uh, it's not clear what you would do in terms of the parentage of the child. They'd be in France. And in reality, countries differ dramatically on whether they recognize what's called just sanguinis, which is citizenship based on the genetic uh, origin of the parent, just solely based on the territory where the child is born, or both. So we have this difference in the world on these things. And the cases of reproductive technology and extraterritorial acts of fertility tourism really complicate matters. I think most people have a strong inclination that the children's citizenship should just be sort of granted and we should look the other way. But if you're serious about deterring this practice, uh, it's a very strong deterrent to say that the children's citizenship or the parentage will not be recognized. Now, not everybody has the stomach for that, and I think there are questions you'd want to ask, like what happens to these children? Are they going to be stateless, or is there a provision under Indian law for them to be Indian citizens? Are they going to be well taken care of? How much notification do we have for this rule? OK, so let's make it very concrete. Let's say I'm a woman in France, and my husband and I can't get pregnant. There's something wrong with my womb. So uh, I ask my sister, well, will you carry our child for nine months and be pregnant? She says no. So I find out that there are agencies in California where I could make an embryo with my husband. We can go to California, have it made, and give it to a woman. She'll put it in her womb. She'll carry the child. I give her $100,000. Uh, now, I should say that kind of surrogacy is very controversial in the United States. So it's actually banned in New York State, for instance. Uh, it's legal in California, and states are all over the place. So uh, the uh, straight couple goes to California, has this done. The child's born. They come back to France, the straight couple with their child you would say, what should happen? Yeah, so let me start with the easy part of this, which is something you didn't mention, which is you might ask, should the California doctor say, can I see your citizenship papers? Oh, you're from France, I'm going to enforce. I don't believe that's the case. So I don't think it's incumbent upon the US doctors to enforce uh, the policies of the French government, for example. They're happy to get the money here. Th that's another, <laughs> a less charitable, but let's just remember it's the doctor and not the lawyer who made that comment on this panel, just to be clear. I'm critical of this industry, that's why. But <laughs> In any event, right, so my view is that um, France would be well within its rights to announce a policy that says we are, are we criminalize uh, uh, surrogacy at home because we think it exploits women. And uh, it would be churlish, it would be uh, uncosmopolitan, it would be uh, terrible of us to think that uh, we're going to announce that policy and as a result, by protecting French women from victimization by surrogacy, we're going to instead encourage and look the other way when Indian women get victimized because of our decision, right? If they really believe this victimizes women. So my own view is that France would be well within its rights to have that view if that's the reason why they've criminalized it at home. And as long as the policy is announced in advance and there's a belief that this will deter people from going abroad, 
Uh, to me, whether it's a wise decision or not, depends on your sense of how many people will you be left over violating the law, uh, you know, playing chicken with the French government. If you think that the number of cases you have left over versus the number of cases deterred, the number of cases left over are small, and there are provisions made for making a home for this child, it may be splitting the difference and say, this child can come to France, but is made available for adoption, or you have to go ahead and adopt this child as any French person would adopt an American child rather than automatically saying you get the benefit of genetic parentage and above the association. So my own view is this is not, unlike other the cases where I think that actually countries that don't extend their law extraterritorially are acting a little hypocritically, this one I think of as a genuinely difficult case. But it's not clear to me that if France refuses to recognize this child, that every time France does this, that's a moral wrong or an improper thing for France to do. The other side is that it's good if a country has a, a set of policies that some of us may think of as repressive, that there be a safety valve. So take countries that say you're not allowed to have an abortion, even if I'm a woman who was raped in my country. There are countries that say you cannot have an abortion, that's illegal. So on the one hand, couldn't you argue, gee, it's great that I have an option. I can go to some other country and have the abortion. Uh, shouldn't I be allowed to do that? And that's my right. And when I come back, they should let me just be. I should not be punished for that. Yeah. So let me give two responses, right? One is, again, from the perspective of this country. If I imagine myself as a legislature of a South American country like El Salvador trying to decide what to do, I've decided my perspective is that abortion is a murder or something like a murder, right? And I've prohibited it at home for that reason. If my interest is in protecting a fetus and the life of a fetus, why should it matter to me that the person steps one foot outside of my border when they do it? And that, to me, is, is the tough question. On the question of safety valves, so imagine that that's not my perspective. Uh, and instead, my perspective is that, no, I want to fight the good fight and get abortion uh, liberalized, and I want at women to have access to abortion. So to me, in some ways, what's interesting about medical tourism is that it's easier for the elites to use it than it is for the rank and file people. And if you think the people who have the most ability to change policy in El Salvador or wherever are actually the elites, if they're able very easily, no, no fuss, no must, to leave the country to get an abortion, they have less of an incentive, my view, is to push for law change. And in general, I think that there is a way in which uh, there's a distributional consequence for making it illegal at home and legal where you're going. And I use this analogy uh, in one of the chapters as a way of just provoking people. If El Salvador were to say, we're going to figure out how many people go abroad for abortions a year, and we're going to say that's our cutoff, our number, and we're going to, instead of allowing people to go abroad, we're going to have a lottery, and the people who qualify for the lottery when you want an abortion you get an abortion. We would say that's crazy, right? That's a crazy way of handling this issue. But in some ways, notice that that's fairer, because at least through a lottery, the people who would have access to the abortions in the country would not be uh, the wealthy, the well-connected, people with passports, people who can travel. So there's a way in which the existing status quo, I think, from their perspective, is bad, because they think the fetuses should be saved. But even from the perspective of kind of justice, that if you think that what matters is actually access to abortion, equal access to abortion, there's a way in which this saps some of the resolve of people who will change it, and also results in particular patterns of distribution of access that we might view as problematic. So let's say, a, just one last question on this. So let's say a country has a policy that much of the world thinks is immoral. And we can think of many examples from Nazis right. to anti-abortion, et cetera. What should be the position of the world community, do you think? Do we say that that's that country, they believe abortion is illegal, that let them do what they do? Should we, as a world community, do anything about that? How should we decide? What would you say? Yeah, so again, I should be clear up front that I'm not a scholar of the human rights approach or human rights uh, approaches. But I, what I would say is that as an international community, we have a view that there are zones of discretion and there are zones of non-discretion. The zones of non-discretion are kind of codified as human rights. We don't, tech, we don't often use hard law. We're much more likely to use soft law interventions to try to uh, deal with human rights violators, including memberships in particular organizations, sanctions, and sometimes international criminal law if they are a party 
to uh, that provision. And so my view is that's probably right. Uh, some amount of experimentation, some amount of difference is desirable. Others are not and violates what we think people are entitled to as human beings. The hard questions come whether some instances of medical tourism uh, involve that. And while I think it's tempting for us here to think that abortion is a case that involves a human rights violation, and that therefore we're allowed to step a little further in the boundary, certainly some religious communities or some uh, would view female genital cutting and the ability to do this and to practice their religion as equally a human right that's going to be violated if the US or the UK extend prohibitions to people going abroad to engage in female genital cutting. So what I've done, not in this book, but in other articles, is I try, I, I, I like to say I also specialize in making people uncomfortable, uncomfortable with comparisons, but try to juxtapose the kind of language and the kind of theory behind uh, abortion criminalization extraterritorially against the criminalization of FGC, of female genital cutting, extraterritorially, and say, uh, does it really, do we really think the two are dissimilar? Are there ways in which they are similar in the structure of the problem. But I think, you know, a lot of this work, what I try to do is we have debates about abortion. We're very familiar, especially among bioethicists, about these debates. I'm not going to say anything interesting or clever that's going to convince somebody who uh, believes that abortion is murder that it's not. What we haven't had a debate about, what we haven't talked about, is when you have a country that believes abortion is murder and criminalizes it, what should that mean in terms of what it does for citizens traveling abroad? We haven't had that as much of that debate, and that's where I think I can make a contribution. Dr. Klitzman wrote an article about mitochondrial transfer to if, if a woman has, has a disease. So my, my question is kind of along the line of the abortion issue as to do you talk about uh, what might be called a noble medical tourism decision where the country technologically may, might not be onto that, but the woman wants to you know, not have a diseased baby, you know, born of that, and if you'd comment on that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, so I think the cases of technological sophistication are quite different from travel for something that is illegal on kind of moral grounds. So it turns out Thailand, for example, is a very good destination for sex reassignment. Historically, they were much better at it than we were, and there were many people who went abroad. The place where the two merge and become tricky actually is my chapter in the book on experimental therapies. So this, is, and you may think MRT is experimental now. It's, you know, it's, it is experimental. When you want something that's experimental, now my own view is there's experimental and there's experimental, right? There are things where uh, we have a view that they might work, they might not work, and you have terminally ill patients traveling for them. And then there are things like most of the stem cell therapies being offered in China, for example, where we have no reason to believe they work. We have good reason to believe that they might cause tumors in some instances. We have reasons uh, to know, we know that they're not collecting data in a rigorous way, and they're not really doing experimentation to find the right answer. They are selling a product. And the thing that's the most tricky about these cases is actually a lot of times in the US, from the US context at least, it's parents taking their children abroad. So my view is it depends a lot on the population. When you're talking about pediatric cases, I think a lot more restriction, and maybe even reporting in some cases uh, by home country physicians of parents who want to take their kids uh, abroad might be in order. When you're talking about adults, my own view is that the closer the condition is to being life threatening or terminal, even though I think it's bad science, even though I think we should fight back with informational interventions, I'm not a strong believer that the state should try to restrict people traveling. I mean, we've seen this movie before in the 70s. It was Laetrile, right? Steve McQueen, the actor, died in Rosarito, Mexico, getting a Laetrile treatment. I think that was too bad. But I understand why, especially for people who are adults and who are facing something terminal or life-threatening, that they may want to try something that has very little chance of success. And I don't think the state should interpose itself there. Just today I had a conversation with a friend, uh, a, a heated conversation, about uh, universal health care, and uh, known as socialism by some. And the, the detractors, their argument against it is, look at all those people who come from England and from Canada to get treated. So it's really not so hot. What's your response to that? Yeah, so I should say I'm a Canadian myself, which is interesting. And I told, 
And as I, I told Robert, my mother actually was a medical tourist to the United States. And you know, mom doesn't mind me telling the story in case she's watching uh, at home. She went into hip replacement. And the method that was available at the time, different in the US, much shorter recovery period. And she was not so uh, excited by the existing queue and decided to, to queue jump, right? So in some ways, that was actually a bonus for Canada, right? One fewer person to pay for their hip replacement, and she thought it was welfare maximizing. The US doctors were happy for the extra business and for someone paying out of pocket a self-pay patient rather than having to deal uh, with uh, insurance. There are two elements here. One is from the perspective of the individual patient, and one is from the, uh, the perspective of the population level. The level of the individual patient, my own view is that if you want high-tech medicine and you want it right now, there's no better place to come than the United States. The population level, though, if you look at the way how much is paid for every quality-adjusted life year or disability-adjusted life year or whatever measure you have in mind, in the US, as against a whole raft of other countries, pay far too much per increment for year of quality of life than these, do these other countries. And while I'm a big fan of universal healthcare system, in fact, you don't need to only look at the universal healthcare system comparators. Even if you look at a place like Germany, which has kind of competing insurance uh, systems, for example, or insurance companies. I mean, it's not publicized, it's privatized, but, it's, but it is price set by the government. Uh, you see that the, what they pay for and what they get uh, is much better than what we do. Well, I want to thank you both for raising so many wonderful issues. Robert, Glenn. Good combination, doctor and a lawyer. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.